Welcome, Iko Sadhoff from uh, day two. Day two brings digital transformation and technology innovation to companies across the globe. I, I read that. I went and looked specifically to say, how do you actually say that? I think that's really interesting. Of course, you know, there, there is, it's a series of words, but there's a lot of meaning behind that. And it's a lot of meaning that means something to me and I think it means something to you. So I'd actually, uh, I, I have a question for you. And in that question, I think you can tell us a little bit more about what day two does. And uh, the question for, that I have for you, which is like the story of my life, is how indeed do you embed technology into the strategy of a company? How do you take all those fun screwdrivers and bits and bytes and actually translate that into something called value? And then how do you measure that value? You know, what is value? And, uh, and, and, and tell me about day two in the process. Okay, um, I think day two, let's, let's discuss day two a little bit first and then I will come to value creation. And uh, so I think the most important thing with new technology is to transfer knowledge. Um, so one of the slogans we use is uh, we make you smarter to stay competitive tomorrow, right? So uh, we always look at business outcomes and business value creation before we even touch technology. Um, if we can't create value with the new technology a company wants or an enterprise wants to use, um, then we are not the company to use, right? So we will really see, you know, what's your strategy, what's your vision, what's your mission? How does the new technology align with that? Do you need that new technology or can you still use old technology, right? Um, there's a lot of old technology still creating a lot of value for a lot of companies. So for us, um, linking business objectives and business goals to technical outcomes is key. Yeah, so we will always see what value does this create for you as a company, right? So container technology without, for instance, automation pipelines and all the other technologies around it don't create any value. Then you can move to all kinds of new, nice, smart technology like containers or serverless, but the value creation is zero. So if you look at point solutions, something we don't do. So one of the key drivers for day two is we are use case driven. So every, we, if we get a really big project of say six months to a year, we will break it up into single say sprints of a couple of months with, a, with an MVP. And every end of this use case needs to have value creation in there. So we will not demo this to, to techn technology people in the company. We will show it to the business. Right, so what did we achieve? How can we move forward from that point onwards? Um, and every small sprint that we create at the company, uh, we determine the value creation over there. So how do we measure that? Uh, for instance, time to market, time to value. So how fast uh, were new features released? What was the feature velocity in the past? You know, what's the feature velocity now? Uh, the fail fast, fail safe methodologies, right? So. How fast uh, can we make incremental updates instead of waiting for six to nine months, right? So to have that faster feature velocity for that company. At uh, the time to market strategy, simplification of the solution, right? There is, there is a lot of things you can tackle and check uh, and determine if you created value, yes or no. Uh, operational costs, right? So not only SLAs, but also SLOs. Uh, all those things we will measure and we will make sure that, uh, for instance, OPEX costs will drop. Um, do you need the same amount of resources to create the same amount of features? Or do you do it in an automated way? There is many things we can measure for, uh, for a company. Uh, it's even about cloud costs, right? So if effectively using clouds creates tremendous amounts of value for, for clients. Uh, we see a lot of customers using tremendous amounts of subscriptions, don't have any control about how they consume the cloud. Um, so we will help them by centralizing the solutions and see if we can, you know, uh, reduce costs. So there are multiple ways of uh, determining if you created value for a client. To be completely fair, it's not up to us. Mm -hmm. You know, the customer will tell us if we created value or not, right? With, with all our outcomes. Um, if we didn't, then we need to see what we need to do differently at that client side, right? So digital transformation, big word, uh, that's the one you can't create any value out, right? It's, it's impossible to measure value out of digital, digital transformation, so. Yeah. 
Um, uh, indeed, you know, in the end, the words change every five years. You know, I think we've both been in the business a while and, you know, we call it today cloud native. Another time it would be called dot com or it might be called, you know, blockchain or whatever. But in the end, I like the focus on value because that is basically always the same. It's always there. And uh, the question is always how one measures value, which is something we could have a whole other discussion about. But I like that focus on, first of all, you have to really sit down with the customer, which means also that you have to have quite a high level of trust with that customer in both directions. Exactly. Um, yeah, that you basically understand the same thing as value. And so the next challenge, I think, especially in our business, in our industry, where we work with so much cool and complex technology, and most of us are basically employed because we know all those details of this technology. How do you, especially as someone who came up yourself from a very technical background up into a position of leadership, how do you motivate your troops, you know, all your uh, engineers, all those guys that are really focused on the details? How do you get them all to focus on value, especially when it changes from customer to customer and put the details of the technology second? Yeah, now this, this is really interesting. Um, I think leading by example is one. Yeah, so uh, I didn't learn this overnight as well. As a CTO, a field CTO of Marantis, I, you know, this is what I did on a day-to-day -day basis, but I had extremely talented people around me that helped me understand value creation and, and, you know, business outcomes and business goals, you know, and we're not technology driven. We're a learning company. Like I explained, uh, one of our main goals for customers is at the end of our projects that they can do it themselves. We are not a company that wants to stay. Uh, we want to transfer our knowledge, our competence, uh, make sure that the customer can own the solutions themselves. Uh, we do the same thing internally. So we have a learning platform uh, that's called Learned. Uh, where we have a 360 feedback loop with our engineers, we set goals for them, uh, we, you know, courses, uh, training, everything they, they need to do or want to do within the company, uh, we deliver via a platform to our engineers. So it's all remote. Uh, that can be books, right? That can be, like I said, courses, uh, that can be one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, and we let them fail. Right, so one of the key drivers for, or the key things for engineers to do is fail, you know, and learn from that. And then the 360 feedback loop will make them better. Not all of our engineers need to do this. Let's make this absolutely clear. We got engineers, we call them headphone engineers, right? In the company, they have a headphone on and they like to code. And that's kind of the eco of, uh, of 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, I ate pizza and I wanted to code and I didn't want to talk to customers. So we have three levels of engineers uh, in our company. We got a normal cloud native engineer, we got a lead cloud native engineer, and we got a principal cloud native engineer. And they all work on different levels in the organization to create single point of context to our clients for, for projects. So our principals communicate to the executives and help with organizational change. And they run pretty much the whole project. And then we got the lead that's managing and communicating to the middle management of the client and it's helping doing culture change within the organization by leading by example in the engineering teams. And then we got the headphone engineers and they're just on the ground doing the actual hands, all of them do hands-on work, right? We don't have anybody that can stay away from that. We're all equal, but it's important to create that one point of contact to our clients. So our principles are much more soft skill driven than our normal engineers. And the normal engineers don't need to be. Yeah. So if you want to be in our organization, we will teach you those soft skills, mm -hmm. right? So how do you communicate to customers? What's the difference between communicating to an executive or middle management? What does an executive need to know? You know, how do you translate his business goals to technical outcomes so he can create value out of the solutions that he needs? How do we then map all these different projects together and how do we create use cases out of them? All that, all those things are kind of divided between our engineers, so our customers don't get confused. Executive got one person to communicate to, middle management got one person to communicate to, and that's how we drive change. Mm. So, your question was, do they need? No, they don't. None of, not all of them need to be soft skill driven and need to be communicative, right? Mm. We are really weird in that sense as a company because on, say, a, a salary or payment level, internally, everybody's equal. So an engineer who's just working with his headphones on but is an extremely good guy to code, 
can earn as much money as a principal engineer that works with executives. Right? There is no difference in a company in that because you need those highly technical driven persons and you need people with a lot of soft skills. Yeah. And right. that combination makes it strong. Yeah, it's a really tiered, uh, well, tiered to, for lack of a better word, you know, that every, it, among the team, you have all the bases covered. Everybody has a role to play, including you. So you're all supporting each other in different uh, roles. And ultimately, of course, as the leader, you're focused on making sure that the value is delivered. And then all the different, let's say the different uh, members of the team play their positions and then in you go and, um, and deliver the project, basically, or deliver the value ultimately. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And this is what you call, you know, I don't like, like I said before, I don't like the word digital transformation at all. I think it's a big buzzword because you can't measure it or, you know, it's really, really a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. But it's about people, process and technology, right? That's the basis. So yeah. you need to change people. And that means mindsets. You need to change process. That means culture. And you need to change uh, the technology side and, of course, the organization. And we got different people who will help our customers on those different levels to combine those three yeah because and that's where you create value if you combine great people with the process and the technology in the right way you will at the end of the line you will create value for that for that customer yeah and then there's the, also the other side of the equation and you know I'm, i've experienced this uh, in my career i'm sure you have where uh, a customer or a you know an it department a, a company is even a ceo of a customer feels under pressure, like they need, they need to adopt some technology or else they will be left behind. I had this like a couple of years ago, I think two years ago, the big thing was blockchain. Everyone was looking for a blockchain project. And if you had a conversation of about five or minutes or so, you figure out what you need is a database. Now, you know, that's it. <laughs> um, but you know, this is a, uh, I, I'm actually, I think it's a good problem. I like when somebody is really interested to uh, look into new technologies, but how do you manage that? You know, how do you manage it in the other way where you need to tell someone, look, what, what you've been doing is fine. Or, you know, what you need is the tried and true solution, not the latest thing. And, you know, put, put to rest the fear that they're missing out on something. How do you manage the customers on that? Again, this, 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 this comes out of a business goal, right? So they, they want to achieve something on the business side. Uh, but it doesn't mean that your technology needs to change all the time, right? So uh, mainframes, were, it, it's pretty much the same thing as the cloud. Yeah. If you manage a data center properly, you do proper capacity management, you have a cloud. So there's a lot of things that people think they need to move to, mm -hmm. uh, but they are not even ready as a, as a customer. Like I said, we, we want to transfer our knowledge I can give you a perfect example of a running client or an actual client right now. In the process of making them cloud native, we need to transfer our knowledge about container technology, about automation, about all that stuff to the client. The client's team is too small actually right now. Then we stop the project because we can't transfer the knowledge, right? And that means that we don't create any value. So actually saying no with an argument, I think helps our clients better then helping them forward into a direction that they don't need. And secondly, they can't manage it. Our company is called day two. We are we're not building point solutions. We think about the future, the day after day one. So what we want is that the customer can handle the solution itself and can grow it and create even more value out of it. And at the moment we deliver that solution to him. Mm -hmm. If we notice that that client doesn't have the skill sets in house, or has already a platform that could deliver the same functionality, but not using containers, but just using virtual machines, then we will advise them to stick with the environment they got and maybe help them on the automation side, right? How can they create more value out of that current platform or help them on the business process side and see, you know, are your business process properly aligned? Can you, can you change something in there? Uh, do you work according to the right methodologies like agile or, or do you have your, do you have Scrum or do you waterfall is still good if it works, yeah. right? So also on the business process side and the technology side, if something works, you don't need to change. Don't let Silicon Valley scare you <laughs> that if you can't release enough features, you will be eaten up, right? It, it's we're already. I think everybody's explaining that VMware would would have been dead already 12 years ago. It's not the case. <laughs> so look around you. You know, and, and get proper advice before you step into a pitfall. Yeah. Because new technology can be a pitfall. And if you can't swim yet, 
Don't do it. You have a pretty interesting background as well. Speaking of Silicon Valley, you spent some time. Actually, I was noticing you've been in all the places at just the right moments. Um, you were in, uh, in Marantis, right? In the beginning to the end of the biggest uh, momentum of OpenStack uh, technology. And you were um, also working at Google, right? Exactly about the moment when they were creating Kubernetes from Borg. Mm -hmm. What was that like? You know, what, what was it like to be a part of these transformations? And what do you see that's uh, very similar? Like what doesn't change over time? You know, what do you see repeating itself? I think, you know, the funny thing is if you, if you just step back, right? And, and overlook and take a helicopter view. All these technologies are not new. Yeah, so that's the first thing, right? Containers already existed a long time ago. If you look at Solaris, Solaris created already Solaris zones, mm -hmm. right? Container technology, right? In a different way. And uh, so it was the way that you want to manage certain things um, and then, you know, containers and repeatability and making really small functions service per service. That was the way to go. Um, I went to Marantas was for me, I think the most exciting time in my career, right? Um, OpenStack was booming. Uh, OpenStack had a pretty deep link with Kubernetes at a certain moment. Oh, I'm sorry. I got a, I got somebody at the door, Lee. No problem. We have an editor. <laughs> yeah. And can, can I, can I answer? Yeah. Yeah. Soon? Okay. Give me one second. Sorry. Oh, Back oh. again. And just like magic, the editor has fixed it. <laughs> okay. So, so let's go back then. Um, uh, I think, you know, like, like I explained, you know, they're, they're not all new technologies, right? The new technologies are based on all the technologies that were already there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there were people that were smart enough to create value out of those new technologies. Yeah. So uh, the Borg system was, was, of course, a system that managed the Google Data Center management platform. And uh, at a certain moment, they saw that this could be a good new technology for the market. Mm -hmm. So Google kind of wanted to open source that, but Google is not an open source company. So they don't have that big open source community behind it. So Kubernetes was, yeah, let's say a platform that was used for one single data center. So single tenant, not multi-tenant. So it was not usable by the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And it went to the open source community and I think Mar and Marantas and Red Hat and uh, IBM all picked it up and they made sure that it became enterprise ready. So working with these new technologies, it's pretty much, if I can't do it, I get bored. Mm -hmm. So for me, working with this new technology, but also determining if those new technologies are usable or valuable yeah. is for me extremely important. So I also skip certain technologies because I just simply think they're not creating any value for any organization. They're really nice to have. They can solve maybe a small problem, but in the long run, you know, it doesn't make any sense for me to even investigate it. Yeah. So Marantas took, uh, like I said, Kubernetes and made it part of OpenStack. Mm -hmm. um, it solved a business problem, edge computing. Yeah. Right. So if you solve a business problem, I think the technology is fine. If you have a certain technology that doesn't solve anything, then why bother? So we took, uh, Kubernetes, uh, we already had OpenStack. Mm -hmm. um, I think Mirantas did a remarkable job in making OpenStack day two ready. Mm -hmm. So OpenStack was a day one solution. And I mean that you could deploy it, but you couldn't manage it. You couldn't patch it, update it, upgrade it. You needed to build a whole new cluster. So we designed and built Mirantas Cloud Platform, MCP. And that was based on container technology. So our OpenStack management plane was running in containers. Mm. And containers were the technology for us to be able to incrementally update and patch those individual services without creating downtime. So by the use of containers, we could build day two functionality into OpenStack. Mm -hmm. And then of course we had a big market that was the telco space. And in the telco space, they needed edge computing. Yeah. Uh, so what we did is we partnered up with a really interesting networking company, uh, won't name any names but I think everybody knows them. Um, and they built a flat L3 network. So we used that so we could spin up their metal servers and put Kubernetes on top of that for edge computing of telcos. So suddenly we have created an OpenStack private cloud built on containers with container technology you could use on top of the VMs, but you could also spin up bare metal systems and put container systems on there yeah. to put in the edge. Mm -hmm. 
So suddenly you have this whole flexible platform that you could use as a private cloud. Um, yeah, and then, you know, that's the reason I follow technologies. If, if you can create more value out of them and make them better and, you know, it, it's like yeah, being a nurse, you know, yeah. you, want to make, you want to make somebody better, right? Instead of, and if you notice, and that's really honest thing, especially now in this COVID period, if you can't help somebody anymore, right? You can't help him anymore. And that's the same thing with technology. If technology is there, but it doesn't create value, yeah. then I, and that's also answered to your qu previous question. What do we advise a company that we say, no, don't use it, mm -hmm. right? Um, the other thing is a combination of those new technologies. Yeah. yeah, I think what's really, really important that you look for a proper combination of open source technologies to drive your business. Mm -hmm. One solution will not create value, right? You need more solutions or more new technologies yeah. to create value for your organization. And that's why it's so complex. A strategy, basically, a technical exactly. strategy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's really great. Yeah, and I, I spent some time, I did, uh, I, I call myself an OpenStack tourist. You know, I spent a couple of years dabbling with it and, remember thinking at the time as it was still evolving that it's like wow you know now i understand that when you put a v in front of something you can call it virtual what you're actually saying is the thing is obsolete but we don't have a replacement so you <laughs> virtualize it <laughs> and i come from the storage industry and uh that first time i experienced that was virtual tape libraries i thought well, why would you do that why would you put well of course because it's solving problems that we haven't replaced the solution for. So, okay, then just virtualize it. And I think, um, you know, we, we have done that with virtual machines, which are slowly becoming containers again. Um, and, you know, where they get back to that original purpose, I think networking probably still has a ways to go on that, you know, um, but there is a term, and this is something, obviously the name of our organization is cloud native X. And yet I can't answer the question, what is cloud native? Because there are so many different interpretations you know, some will say uh, anything born in the cloud. Some will say if it's Kubernetes. Um, I think we're coming to a point where it's just IT, anything that's IT, you know. <laughs> How would you define it? Yeah. yeah, I think you got a good point. You know, all those in the beginning cloud native technologies, if you look at CNCF, of course, it's, it's, it's for container technology, right? Yeah. The, the name itself, you have cloud for cloud, cloud native for, for container microservices technologies. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the line, everything comes together. Right, so everybody now using the word cloud native for everything. Uh, DevOps is not DevOps anymore, right? So we have a lot of these terms that I, I don't think a lot of people fully understand what they actually mean mm -hmm. uh, because they've been used into different kind of context. Yeah. So for me, cloud native means everything around the cloud. So and that can be, it can be automation, uh, it can be the cloud itself, it can be serverless, it can be uh, containers in the cloud or container technologies, you know, AKS or Kubernetes or name it, the one you want to use. I think all of that creates a cloud native strategy because people use that word, right? They say, we're going to have a cloud native strategy. Does it mean you're only going to use container technology? Because if you're going to do that, you're not going to create any value. Because like I said in the beginning, if you don't build proper automation around it to create faster feature velocity, mm -hmm. then containers don't make any sense. Yeah. Right, and where are you going to run those containers? Do you got the skill to, to deploy Kubernetes yourself or do you want to use a, a service like AKS in Azure? Right, that you don't need to manage it yourself. At least you still need to manage parts of it. But the way you consume that platform, that's where you create the value. Right, so and for me, end to end, from, from how you're going to automate it, deploy it, manage it, cr and create your new features, that's for me cloud native. And I think I've heard someone say that in five years, we won't even use that word. You know, it'll just, uh, it'll be there. It's kind of like, you know, in the nineties we had uh, ETCP IP, but who talks about that anymore? You know, <laughs> it was the most important thing, you know, uh, was a token ring or ethernet or, you know, these kind of things. And it becomes the, the foundation of everything. So, so you spent uh, a good amount of time in the Silicon Valley and, of course, outside of it, where we are. Um, I've done the same. I've had that kind of experience, that sort of paradigm shift of being in the center of everything tech and then uh, being anywhere except for that. Uh, what do you think is the biggest fundamental difference? You know, everyone goes to the Silicon Valley. They think that's the place to be. But what do you think about the difference between that and actually being out in the world working in technology? Oh, yeah, that's a really, really good one. I think I learned a tremendous amount in, in Silicon Valley. 
uh, first of all, you need to be able and capable of working there, right? It's target-driven. If you don't meet your targets, you're out, right? It, it, it's really, really simple. It's a harsh world. Um, but I like that, right? So, but it needs to be you, you know, you need to be able to live and breathe that. Um, Silicon Valley is about building initial solutions. And that's what I learned, right? They're really good in building new technology, but how we are as, a, as an enterprise or you as a customer, are you going to consume that new technology? That's, you know, they don't care about that, right? They care about it at least, but they don't have any knowledge most of the time to help you as a client. Now you got a new solution. How do you grow it? How are you going to use it? How are you going to create value out of this new solution? They're all great solutions, most of them, but this is the part I was missing in Silicon Valley. So this is also the reason why I became a field CTO at a certain moment, to help our clients in the long term. And I think that's also the biggest difference between Europe and Silicon Valley. The first question in Europe is, how much money am I going to make out of this? Right? So how much value am I going to create? You know, what will be my return on investment? Um, those things are, for a technology company, they really don't give a damn about that, right? They just want to sell you a new technology and then, you know, you need to figure it out yeah. what you're going to do with it. So also a big difference, I think, in Europe, soft skills for engineers, for instance, right? Engineers are not purely technical. They have much bigger sense of business most of the time than, than in Silicon Valley. Um, and yeah, for me, what's the, the, the speed of innovation, of course, Right. The thing is that we already talked about all these new technologies and will you advise them to customers? Silicon Valley just innovates too fast for Europe, innovates too fast for Australia, innovates too fast for Asia and for the Middle East. So once we finally got kind of, a, we had adopted virtual machines and we were like, yeah, you know, we, we decreased our footprint in our data centers, we've done it. We were just done as an enterprise. And this is a really, really hard process to go through as a, as, a, as a big enterprise with all, you know, changing your business processes to align with your new technology and do all that kind of stuff. And before you're done, somebody's calling you and telling, yeah, but the stuff you just built, that's old school. <laughs> right? We got containers now. So can we please move to containers? And so what I saw happening in these large enterprises as they started to innovate on top of innovation, and then it's a, it's, it's a road to failure, mm -hmm. right? So always finish previous projects properly before you start innovating uh, and doing new stuff. Yeah. So they were not done in the virtualization of their platform or the automation of their platform. And they suddenly said, listen, some teams, and this is a technology driven decision most of the time. Some engineers said, yeah, but I read on the internet, we now got containers with Kubernetes, so we're going to use that. They don't understand the cultural change. They don't understand the process change you need to go through, your, your knowledge within your company that needs to be there. Yeah. So before you know it, you got 10 innovation projects. And that's, I think, also a big difference between Silicon Valley and here, mm -hmm. is we want business continuity. We want business stability. St stability and I think that's key. Yeah. You can innovate as long as you don't impact your online business processes, right? That, that's key. Yeah. And Silicon Valley just wants you to innovate mm -hmm. because they deliver you new pro products and you, you know, you're better off using them. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Now I'm back. I still miss it. Yeah, the, the fast pace of innovation, uh, building those new technologies, thinking about two years ahead, you know, what's going to happen? Yeah. How are we going to adapt to that new marketplace? Like now, for instance, 5G, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Admirantes with container technologies and edge computing, 5G was kind of the next stop, right? That, that could happen. So yeah, those things, I'm more now helping enterprises um, and helping them to make the actual good decision do you need these new technologies how are you going to use them what value do you want to create create out of them it's a completely different role mm -hmm. than i had in silicon valley as working in a product company yeah no, I, I completely agree i mean i i miss also the like you say the speed of innovation i miss personally also like the appetite to take risks you know like yeah let's try it why not what could go wrong oh it went wrong let's do something else i love that and i miss that on the other hand, I guess you're like you say the trade-off, and why I like a lot what you're doing is that you're also farther away from the end value. 
you know, the, the ultimate value of the thing you're building happens really far away and you rarely get to see it with your own eyes. You know, I've worked in Silicon Valley based companies as their guy in Europe. And it's always that moment when you finally fly the engineer out to visit the customer and you see on his face where he goes, oh, now I get it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's always fun. So I think people in your role are really important, people who understand both sides of it, the, the supply side of it in the Silicon Valley and the demand side of it just about everywhere else you know, and can make that link, which is really, really important. And uh, day two, so you, that day two was just founded, I think, if I got it right, just this year. It's a very new venture for you. What is that like? You know, what was it like to set that up, you know, just as an entrepreneur? Besides a, a technical uh, genius, you're also an entrepreneur. Um, and, you know, how has that been so far? And where are you going next with day two? Okay. Yeah. Now, now we have to talk about COVID anyway, right? So. <laughs> yeah. We, you and I agreed, you know, let's skip this subject because, you know, I think it's a really important thing around the world, but yeah. still, you know, I think a lot of people had enough of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we were, we were smart enough. And this is means Frank Beemster and myself as my co-founder um, to start this company February uh, this year. Uh, and then, of, of course, this whole COVID pandemic hit. Um, I think every, uh, how do you call it? Um, yeah, these type of events also create possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. But it has been a struggle and I think a really positive struggle for us because we learned a lot. It, 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 all enterprises, most of them close down, right? They sit on, on top of their money. They don't want to spend. Innovation is a cost center, right? Um, if you can't determine directly the return on investment of certain solutions, then I can understand that they say, listen, we wait with these type of innovations. So... Um, I know what I don't know, and I know what I know. Yeah, so I'm not. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I already been longer than than just day two, right? Working for myself as a freelancer and doing all kinds of other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to build another type of company. That was the only kind of push for me to become an entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, I saw in a lot of companies how engineers were treated. You know, they everybody is preaching about having no hierarchy, speaking truth to power, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it actually doesn't happen. So how do you build a real engineering culture within your company where everybody's equal? You know, we're an absolutely flat company um, where we can teach those things like failing is okay. You know, innovation is okay. You know, making mistakes during that process is okay. Um, but also, you know, being uh, all together as one company with one goal and one focus, that's what we wanted to do as day two. And the other part was that, then we go back into the Silicon Valley challenges again. How are we going to create value out of solutions that really smart solutions and I think really needed solutions that are created in the Valley or created even in Europe now, but also Israel has a really big innovation center. Mm -hmm. um, how do we make sure that those customers can use those technologies, but especially create value out of them after the creation or the build of those new technologies? And that's why we call day two. In, in the process, day one is like a design type of phase. Yeah. Day two is how you operationalize your solution. So how are you going to operate it? How are you going to manage it? Can you manage it? How you then integrate it into your current business services? How do you uh, extend it to your legacy environment, right? Because there is no innovation platform that most of the time that is used without a legacy backbone. Mm -hmm. So there is, uh, that's for me were the reasons to start day two. I saw a lot of companies doing hit and run projects. So they build projects and really nice in, in off the pro And I did it myself, let's be honest, right? I was really good at this stuff, especially in OpenStack in the beginning. I was, I was a king at building snowflakes. But I also noticed that it didn't give me the satisfaction. Yeah. Right? I wanted to really help the, a customer in, to become future ready, not to become ready right now. Yeah. Because that, that's what we call snowflakes, right? Those are solutions that are built by new technology companies that don't grow or are not used. Mm -hmm. So they want this new technology, they build it in their own company, but nobody knows how to use them or nobody really actually knows how to create value out of them. So you have spent a lot of money on a new technology, but it doesn't do anything. It's just standing there, zooming around, right? So how do we as a company, that's I think the focus of day two, help these customers to create that value out of it. And besides that, build this engineering culture that I think is needed, right? It, it, 
I want to work with my fellow peers. We only have colleagues, right? I don't have people reporting to me. It's, it's a colleague of mine. Yeah. They're all colleagues of mine. And we all drive success together. Not just the day two success, but also the customer success. Yeah. And, and that's I, hard, by the way, right? It's, it's not an easy task. Yeah. No, you definitely have to balance things because, of course, there are times when you have to, well, you know, I, I've always seen it as everybody is a team member with different responsibilities. And um, your responsibilities also sometimes include having to do difficult things, of course, right? And, uh, but um, yeah, no, I, I think that's great. And that's one of the things me as a younger person growing up in my career in Silicon Valley, in that sort of ethos was really important because it was like, you know, go ahead and try something. If you succeed, you're the king. If you fail, it's okay. Just try something else, you know, and that when you feel comfortable, when you can trust that, that's really when, when you really innovate things. Yeah. And I, we, we, have, we talked about buzzwords. What do you think of that one? Innovation. You know, what, what is that actually? Another word everyone uh, defines. If you ask five people what that word means, you'll get 10 different answers. What do you think it means? Yeah, for me, it's, it's about becoming future ready, right? That, that's it. So what's going to happen in the future that can impact your organization in a negative way? Yeah. Right? Um, if you know that, then you can participate, right? Do you need new technologies? Do you need to change the structure of your company? Do you, because innovation is pretty much on everything, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we innovate a new chicken, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and he can he can he, he can lay more eggs or you know have, 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 have a bigger egg i the thing is do we really need it so innovation for me is what's going to happen in the future where you as a person or as an organization or you know as an individual has to adapt to right because that's what's going to happen in the near future and you need to be ready for that yeah um there's over innovation <laughs> i don't know how, to, how the english word is but that's how i say that it's it's like we need to innovate yeah. because other people do it yeah yeah and it's a, a typical telco problem by the way they look at another telco and they say oh yeah hey, geez they're all building OpenStack. we need OpenStack as well mm -hmm. and and you know they don't right or even the other company didn't need it but they just wanted to innovate yeah so innovation became something like if somebody else does it i need to do it mm -hmm. right it's it's not um yeah it's not really a goal or an objective or, you know, not something you say, okay, if we do this, we will jeopardize our business or not do this, we will jeopardize our business. I think that's the only question you need to ask yourself uh, about innovation, but you can innovate anything. Yeah. Like I said, a mainframe is a cloud, right? It really, there's no difference. Um, a, data, a fully equipped data center with good procedures is a cloud. Uh, container technology, you can also do it in different ways with virtual machines, right? You can build microservices also on a virtual machine. It's a different thing, of course. You know, it's a different technology underneath, but you can almost achieve the same functionality. So, yeah, no, I don't... I've been a chief innovation officer. <laughs> so you <laughs> ask, me, ask me a difficult question. Um, for me, as a chief innovation officer, what do I need to do within my company to make sure that we survive in the future. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's it. And, and then you determine which technologies or which organizational changes or whatever you need uh, that you need to do to be ready in the future. And there are 80% of technologies you don't need. Yeah. And 20% you do need. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really comes back to needs and value in the end, I think, you know, that, um, uh, we, were, we had talked a, a couple of weeks back, I was telling you a story of a finance guy who told me that innovation is matching a need with the technology, an unmet need with a technology. And that technology could be anything, even a broomstick, you know, uh, and the innovation is the matching, not, not the broomstick, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's why it's, you know, really brilliant what you guys are doing is like, some, yeah, sometimes you need the latest thing, but only if you're doing something that, you know, all the other things can't do, if it's an unmet need and the only technology that can do it. So that, that's, uh, that's really important, I think, what you guys are doing there. Yeah, exactly, because, you know, innovating a current legacy platform you can, or, or innovating, you know, changing it and making it better is also innovation, right? Yeah. It, it doesn't mean you need to go to a new technology, you know, look at how you consume your current technology. Maybe you can make that a lot better uh, and, and achieve your goals. Yeah. Well, so that's for you as a company's innovation. You're becoming more future ready. 
Um, I think for real innovation, you need to step back and take your time, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of companies innovate because they want to innovate. Maybe uh, look at your legacy platforms, your old school platforms, and the way you want to call it. Make them a bit better. Buy yourself time. Investigate properly where you want to go. What's your strategy? What you welcome, which bi what business value do you want to create? Mm -hmm. Define that properly, and then find technology that will help you create that value. Yeah. And at this moment in time, and I think also a lot of Dutch companies and a lot of European companies are not thinking about that value creation. So we always take our customers in an assessment and say, listen, step back. What's your strategy? So Mr. Executive, what's your role? And then we build bridges in the communication. We define a dictionary because a, a, a business guy talks completely different language than a technology person, so an engineer. So we help them translate to understand each other. And we build a dictionary for both of them that if your executive talks about this business goal, it means this technical outcome, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and we do that in this assessment. We say, what's your strategy? And then how we define uh, key objectives and or key results and objectives. You know, how can we make sure that you realize and go and, and, and get this strategy completed? Mm -hmm. And, but we take our time to do that. And we first want everybody in the organization to speak the same language, because I think that's key. Yeah. If you want to create value, the executive needs to understand the engineers, the engineers need to understand their boss, and the boss needs to understand the executives again. Mm. So I think building those bridges and, and making them speak the same language is key. And then take your time. And if we, we are use case driven, as I explained, so we do really small projects, prove our technology, if after two projects we notice that this is not the right technology for that enterprise, then you know we should, we need to stop. Yeah, and we will lose money. I get it. You know, and sometimes my CEO is like, "Eco, what are you doing?" But if we can't create that value, we will, we will not continue. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and I think that's that's really key. And I hope that most organizations will start thinking about. But they need to understand, yeah, let's go back a little bit. I, I think you asked me also a question about Silicon Valley versus Europe. Yeah. Silicon Valley has a really hard time to understand the enterprise. Mm. You know, they are built around a certain concept, flat, hierarchy. You know, the Googles are now big and the Facebooks are really big. Mm -hmm. But they're built around a certain kind of way of thinking and the way they are organized. Yeah. They don't understand that enterprise companies are politically driven. You know, they got a lot of processes. There's a lot of bureaucracy. There's a lot of things happening there. But to be honest, these companies make money. Yeah. So it's important for us to be also that bridge between those innovation companies and those enterprise to speak the same language. You know, what actual problems of the enterprise do you want to solve? Two words, and I forgot to tell them. Customer intimacy. Mm -hmm. Customer satisfaction drives success. Yeah. Yeah. So we can build the best technology and then all my engineers can sit there and say, listen, Nico, we've done a freaking brilliant job, right? You know, this is the best thing we built. Yeah. But we have a 360 feedback loop, not just for us to our engineers, but also our customers back to our engineers. So we use a tool that gives our customers the ability to, to give feedback to our engineers on the stuff they have built. Yeah. And at the moment you create a proper customer intimacy and customer relationships and you create a success for them, mm -hmm. they give you the answer if you build the right solution, right? If my engineers say we build the best solution in the world, I st it starts itching, right? I like, really? Are you sure? You know, <laughs> because I, I didn't see any feedback from our, our customer, right? Yeah. Did you deliver, deliver the value for him? Yeah. So customer intimacy and satisfaction are key to drive success. And to go back to the whole beginning of the interview to do that, you need to be a partner and not a vendor. Yeah. Right. So I, I think that's really, really important for us. Our relationships are built on trust, on people. Um, innovation is built on trust because most of our clients don't even understand those, those new technologies. So they need to be able to trust us that we give them the proper advice. Yeah. Um, so we want to be a partner in crime and we don't want to be a vendor. You know, we need to build that relationship with them. We're going to succeed or fail together, right? That's the, the philosophy of day two. Yeah, that's great. And I think for our part, Cloud Native X, that's exactly the area where we want to focus as well. You know, what is, what's in it for the end user? And the end user isn't always a developer or an engineer or a guy with a GitHub repository. 
the end user is also the executive, the CEO, the product owner, their customer. And uh, I think especially in this area of cloud native, there's a lot of resources for the technical people. Um, I, you know, I definitely, I love this focus on value. I'd love to have you back as we cover more topics because I think we can take this theme and really uh, dig deep in there. <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate it. Is there anything you want to uh, cover before we wrap up? No, I don't, I don't think so. Okay, no, great. I, nice interview. Yeah, no, nice it, thank you. It was great, great, uh, great to talk to you. I hope, and I'm sure that we'll have more of these, and uh, maybe, like I say, we'll find a nice topic and dig deeper into that on this on this theme. And I think it'll be great. So, thanks very much, Eco. Hope to see you in person yes. soon. We're not that far away, so I'm sure we will in the near future. We definitely will. Cheers. Have a good day. Thanks, Eco.